So he's worrisome when the cat's more popular than that. All right. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at the Mooney Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. And today's class is we're going to talk about grapes, uh, kiwis, and pomegranates. So, uh, of course, uh, of these, the grapes is the most widely grown. Apparently, uh, <clears throat> about 75% of all grapes are grown for wine or more, but uh, we're going to be talking mostly about uh, table grapes, ones that we prefer eating. Uh, so, grapes are native around the world, pretty much throughout the Northern Hemisphere. So, there's quite a few grapes native to North America, Europe, and Asia. <clears throat> Of course, they grow them all around the world, but that's where they're native to. And the most important grape is the European grape. But the main thing to know about the European table grape, which was mainly Thompson seedless, is that its original name was Sultania or Sultana II. It's from Persia. So that's one grape that we have a hard time growing in Orange County because it'd rather be in Riverside or Fresno. Uh, that's its climate. We're too close to the ocean. We're too humid, too cool. Uh, it tends to get mildew really bad around here, and it, and it tends to uh, also not get hot enough to develop fruit properly. So, um, I mean, if you're the further away from the ocean you are in Orange County, the better off you are. So we see a few people having success more in the inland Orange County areas. But if you're by the coast at all, it's 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 just too cool here to grow that one. Um, plain, which is another famous one at the supermarkets, the red seedless also <clears throat> can have trouble here from the mildew. It's warm enough, but mildew is is definitely a problem many years. So we don't really promote either one at our store, although it is sold locally throughout the area at some of the box stores. <laughs> but there are better grapes for our area. So the grapes that we sell mostly are called the hybrid grapes, which they cross the European grapes with the American grapes. Most American grapes that they're using are native to Canada or New England states, and those don't need the heat, and they are from a more humid climate, uh, and definitely more humid, so they're more mildew resistant. So. We're trying to get, you know, the European grape, the Thompson seedless, which is the model. Uh, most people like the grape because the skin is rather tender, but the flesh is rather firm. I mean, you can say crispy. It's not really crispy, but it's it's not soft at all. So you got that juicy, crisp flesh, but tender skin, whereas uh, American grapes, typically Concord, soft flesh, uh, tough skin. And then you get the muscat grapes, which are native to the deep south, soft flesh, plastic skin. You can't even eat that skin. I mean, it tastes great, but you can, you know, it's like eating a piece of plastic. You can't really, no one swallows the skin on the, uh, on the uh, muscat grapes. <laughs> now, most grapes, nature in wild, the male and the female plants are separate plants. But in cultivation, they've chosen the ones that you may, they make the same, the male and the female flowers in the same cluster. So on the internet, there's some argument about having to need male grapes around, but uh, all the grapes we're selling are, are self fertile grapes. Hmm. So our favorite table grape, our number one seller, we do have in stock this time right now. It's December right now, and we can only get a few grapes. We grow a lot of grapes ourselves from cuttings uh, that we do in the winter, uh, but those grapes aren't usually ready to sell until about May. So we have another grower that does some grapes for us. Fortunately, they do the most popular grape we've sold in the last 20 years called Suffolk Red. So that's a fairly large um, quite light red grape. I mean, in my house, some years, grapes are barely pink. You'd say they're kind of a light green, slightly pink grape, but still extremely, extremely sweet. 
no resonance overtones. Um, I don't know, some people will tell us it tastes like cotton candy. It's got that cotton candy flavor. Now, it's not the same grape in the stores that's called cotton candy. It definitely has that flavor. So we do. Our number one seller has been supple bread. Now, that's really the only TV grape we're selling this time of year. So we'll, we'll mention uh, some of the other grapes. Well, we do grow. The four or five varieties of white grapes. They're actually yellow or green, but they call it our white. And then uh, we sell three varieties of black or pur dark purple or burgundy grapes. And we have about four or five types of red grapes. So if you want to wait until uh, uh, May to buy those, we'll have pretty much all those at that time, but this time of year. Uh, supple grapes about all we have in the table grapes. I might mention one other one that we do have, but uh, not a major one. The supple bread, <clears throat> the American grape we have right now. So this is a hybrid, seedless. Um, it generally has won a lot of taste tests in California among the hybrid grapes, the ones that. Usually don't get mildew. Uh, we've only seen mildew on the grapes. So when grapes are affected, the mildew affects the fruit more than it does the leaves, although it can affect the stems and the leaves. It's the grapes that have the problem. If the grapes get mildew, they crack open before they're ripe and they start fermenting before they're ripe. Well, that one has been our, our best seller, uh, hybrid between European and American grapes. We do have Eastern Concord, which is American. We've heard that it's got a little bit of European, but we generally consider it American grape. So it's a smaller, dark purple grape, a tough skin, green flesh, uh, seeds in it. Now there is a, a grape called California Concord, which we do not carry because it was developed not for Southern for Orange County, it was developed for the Central Valley. So it's a Concord that can handle the extreme heat of the Central Valley, whereas it wouldn't do well here. Uh, the Eastern Concord, which is from New England area, uh, which has summers, you know, same temperature range as we are, 80s. Uh, that's Eastern. Eastern Concord uh, does better here than California Concord does. And then we're also carrying one wine grape. We can get others, but they're not really heavily so heavily demanded by our, our customers. So the wine grapes are actually European. And and truthfully, oops, most European wine grapes are also hybrids, They're not true European, because they had to select them for parts of Europe, and you know Germany grows them, and it's not like Persia there, so they had to hybridize them a bit to to make them more compatible to those climates. But generally, the wine grapes, even though they taste really good, are not table grapes because they have real thick skin and they do have seeds. Um, the flavor of grapes generally is considered to be in the skin. <laughs> so the thicker the skin, the better the flavor. However, you know, the, it's, the skins are more tough and, and not tender. They're so not as fun to eat as the table grapes would be. But uh, they certainly taste fine. There's no problem with the with the wine grapes there, and they and quite a few of them do well in Orange County. We're close to being um, the climate that they like. You know, they're mostly grown what near the Napa Valley, or that's a little more inland than right here. In the Bay Area, it acts a little more like, say, Fullerton or maybe Chino. 
Okay, so that's the variety we have right now. Now, I'll mention, nah, I'll mention that one. They're not really ready yet. So these are the three we have at the moment. Uh, now, we'll talk about training them for table breaks, and then we'll mention the differences on the other ones. So this is a about a three-year-old grape plant. Now, yeah, about three years old. So on this plant, the parts of it that are two years old generally have a cracking bark on them. You can see them here and here. You got this bark cracking on the newer growth. It's still smooth. Now it is true on a on a more mature plant, even the newer growth, sometimes toward the end of the year, the bark starts cracking on it too because it's expanding so quickly from the fast growth of the plant that uh, it's hard to tell the difference. In fact, this may be one year old branch here too. I think it is. It's just that you cut it. Start sprouting out the side branches got so vigorous that uh, the bark on there cracked too. So the older parts of this plant are down here and here. So the main thing to know about grapes, no matter what shape you make your plant. So there's, you know, in, in vineyards, they generally train all their vines the same way just to make it easier for their, their workers to trim them quicker. So one of the most popular ways of doing vineyards right now say this is the ground here, and these are wires here held up by posts. They call it the vertical cordons. Now, this is relatively new. So if you look in books that are 20, 30 years old, they'll have a different method. But the method that a lot of the vineyards are using now, because it's less maintenance, is a row, their plants. Now they space them between the set of plants between three and eight foot apart, depending on the variety. Now, uh, most grapes can grow 50 foot that way and 50 foot that way, so they can actually space them 100 foot apart. But it takes about three or four years, well, actually not that long, maybe two or three years to cover that, well, three or four years to cover that distance. So they'd rather go and get into production faster, so they put them closer together. So say eight foot apart. So what they do is they usually grow the vines horizontally on the first wire, and a lot of times they grow two stems, so they'll have one going that way, one going this way. And that'll be their first year of growth. They'll grow at those two directions only. And usually the plants aren't that big. So if it takes them, you know, by that in California way, by a first year, you'll maybe go four feet this direction, four foot this okay. direction also. And then the second year, they'll train the side branches straight up the wires. They might be coming from, you know, they don't. They might come from different sides of the branch. So some of these come up this way. Some have to develop to turn around and go back up that way. And here we have this top wire, what, six, seven foot off the ground. So what, ha what they found out happens is that they'll grow off the wire. And when they reach about six foot in length <clears throat> without any support, they just stop growing. So if there's no support, and they're hanging out here six foot, they stop growing. So the old days, what they would do is they'd run this on the second wire up, the main branches, and then grew these branches on these wires and just let them go on along the wires. You grow like 20 foot in both directions during that year. And then you have to cut a lot of that off. Well, they found out to go straight up off this wire up into space. <laughs> And this land and hang out, they just stop growing. And I've seen that in my own yard. They come off my support, just come out like this, and then they just stop. If they attach to something, then they keep going. If they have support, 
they just keep on going. So there's something about not being supported, maybe moving around the breeze that stops the growth of this branch. Of course, when branches are hanging straight down at the tip, that's a signal for any any growth to stop. Most plants will not grow when their branches are hanging down. So that actually might be the reason when this thing goes out like this and then arches over, it just stops. But if it's going horizontal, it just keeps on going. Now, so they've got this growth coming up now. It's coming off of one-year-old wood. So this one-year-old wood growing off, you're gonna get two clusters forming. So they'll have one or two clusters forming on each of these upright stems. <clears throat> now during the year, they're growing a lot more stems. So what they do at the end of that year after they harvest these grapes is choose the nicest stems that are new, not these stems that are already fruited um, that they left there, but these newer stems coming off here. Sometimes they'll save the stem where the food is on it, but often the ones without the food are thicker and stronger. So uh, they'll save those. What they do is they don't save the entire stem. So they save usually if it's a table grape, two to three foot of it. If it's a wine grape, they, they save less. But if it's a table grape, they'll save two or three foot of these stems and then they'll grow and make fruit. And then uh, they'll grow new branches. So looking at this plant, we'd like to save the nicest stems that are made that are two to three foot long. So this one here is a very nice thick one, probably cut it to about here. So you can see we trained this to stay in this pot. So, you know, again, it doesn't really matter what shape you make it. We train it to be in this pot. And because um, it's all supported, after it comes off, we have to keep cutting it so it doesn't get it get in the way. But this is a nice stem to save two or three foot of it. So if you save about this much of this, every node on here, one, two, three, four, five nodes that I've saved, each node will make a, another stem come in off of that with two or three clusters of grapes. So even if you only save one stem, two or three foot, you might already have 10 clusters of grapes forming. Then you can choose another one, say this one here, save two or three foot of that, another 10 clusters of grapes. And that's pretty much, you know, if you want nice clusters, that's pretty much all this plant in this size container can produce. I mean, here's another stem that we potentially can save two or three foot. Now you're up to 15 clusters. Now, as you get more clusters on this size of plants in this size container, then the berries will get smaller, the clusters will get smaller. So if you really want impressive clusters, you now if you're making, you get a node here and a stem comes off with two clusters on it. Generally, they cut off the smaller one of the two before they grow too big. You can tell when they are when they have the flower buds on them how big the clusters are going to be. You go, okay, I'll cut off one of those. Now in Japan, where size grapes is really important to get money on, they'll take those clusters and cut half the cluster off. And then the grapes get much larger. Yeah. The individual grape gets much larger. When do you, when do we, do we cut this back uh, now when the leaves are falling off. I mean, uh, if the grape plants in the ground and the roots are kept warmer, it won't go, it may not go totally dormant and you'll just have to, you know, say in January. So they start growing in earnest usually March, April, either March or April. So you want to have the plant cut back by the end of winter, sometime by the end of winter. Have you trimmed this yet? No. Okay. I was just because I just curious. Now we have other plants out there we trimmed severely already. This one we left for this class. We trimmed it to get it out of the way, you know. So when they do grow, um, you don't have to let it grow all the way out here. 
you don't have to let it grow keep on growing you can cut off uh the vine after the bunch so we at our house we cut it off maybe five feet beyond the bunch well they actually did a study in university of california actually did a study because some vineyards the, the workers were cutting the vine too close to the cluster and it was killing the plants because they didn't have enough energy to both finish the grapes and provide energy for the next year's growth. So they wanted to determine what length the vine after the cluster formed that they need to keep. And they determined it was it was three feet. That's if you're trimming it while it's got the grapes. Right. You wait and you can trim it back more. Yeah, but you well, you don't want to cut it back too short. You want to have your you need that growth for next year's crop. Right. So so if you had a cluster of grapes on there right where you are, where that stem is. And yeah, right there. Let's say the cluster grapes. Would you go down like four feet and then cut? Yeah, I like four feet better. So let this grow, keep growing to about here, and then you can keep clipping it there without any harm to the plants bigger for next year or the grape. Okay, so after a cluster, you need to leave at least four feet. I like four feet. Okay. University said three foot. So, uh, but yeah, in fact, I I would I did it originally at five because I didn't I thought well I didn't want because that's only about three or four leaves like uh, I want at least four or five leaves after that cluster of feet it's but apparently you only need three or four so these require full sun don't they no no grapes so grapes in nature generally grow in trees so. I've grown grapes on the north side of my house under trees. Really? And, you know, they're not... That's my shade plant? Yeah, I mean, they're in nature, they grow on trees. So, or they ramble through bushes, you know, that's their nature. So, they, you know, they, of course, in the vineyards, they're all in full sun. That's what I see. Um, but when they're hanging there in a tree, what happens, they might take a few weeks longer to ripen. Or to get sweet. Because grapes will hang <clears throat> many months after they're ripe. Mm -hmm. They're still hanging there. And as long as the birds don't get them, you can leave them there for a long time. In fact, they said in the Roman Empire, the way they would store grapes for the winter was they cut off the vine with the grapes attached, stick the vine in a vase of water and put it in their basement. And they'd say they would stay nice and firm all the way into winter. Mm -hmm. So they'll hang on the, the vine for a long, long, long time. Well, I could put this in a corner of the yard that is north facing, so it's on the south fence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had uh, so I had my one of my first grapes ever grew. It was next to my patio, which was a solid covered roof patio, uh, and I planted an apple tree next to it. And the apple tree got so big, it shaded the my structure with the vine. And I go, okay, this thing's getting maybe two hours of sun on it now. <laughs> and it was it was incredible. I was getting 40, 50 clusters on a six-foot-wide vine, and they were fine. They were sweet. I was going, okay, this is interesting. Here I have it, you know, between a solid roof and a tree with that's got leaves on it, and it's only getting a crack of sun two hours during the day and it was you know sweetening just fine i mean it wouldn't be sweet when it first turned color it took a while but it was sweet it, uh, i didn't find any problem with it at all so now they do say uh, like they've done a study on citrus trees food on the south side food on the north side they said you know the north side hardly gets any sun at all the fruits they couldn't tell the tasters couldn't tell the difference between the food on the south and north side but when they analyzed the contents of the fruit, the fruit on the south side had almost double the sugar and the acids than the north side did, but they couldn't taste the difference because the balance was still there. Same balance, but a lot less content on the north side. That's true, I think, because I have three citrus lined up and the tangerine tree on the one side, they all look the same. And then you cut them, but but for some reason on the left side they just seem to be sweeter. And it's mm. true with the caracara too. And I don't know if it's just you can't really tell until you really eat one and then you eat the other. But I think that's a that's I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the difference in 
taste, they said, uh, in citrus is really weird because the, and it, it's, I guess this is true with a lot of fruits, the amount of sugar and the acidity are independent of each other. And sometimes one week, the acidity will be higher in the, and then the sugar. The next week, the sugar catches up and gets higher in the acidity and it tastes sweeter. So they said in the orchards, especially in California Central Valley, they're testing every week to see if they can pick them yet because they can't pick the oranges legally until the sugar content is a certain ratio to the acidity. So, you know, they don't want to sell, they don't want any of the farmers to sell sour, tart oranges. So they made them follow the rules as far as that, that sugar acid balance goes. And that's probably true of a lot of different fruit, uh, the acidity and the sugar uh, you need that balance. Yeah. Okay, so shape of the vine, there's no rules there. You know, in the vineyards, they have everything at the same level. The, the branches that are permanent, same level. Um, everything at the same level. The fruit will all be forming right around the same level. And what that does for the vineyards, they found out if you're the same height off the ground, the fruit will ripen at the same time. The fruit that's higher on the vine ripens first. The fruit that's lowest on the vine ripens last. No matter what the shape of the branches are, it's higher, it ripens fur faster. So for a homeowner, yeah, it doesn't really matter. You can make this, the, the, the permastructure vine anything. Like there are some people making the permastructure just on one side, and then all their vines grow off horizontally so the fruit up here is going to ripen first this one ripens last it's a table grape what's you know there's no there's no problem with that you just harvest these first and these last so is there any a time when you ever trim the bob the original growth branch that goes this way you could do it i mean the main but this would be so this is the permanent structure for the growers to work with, but there's no rules there. I used to cut my vines down to this is stump every year with two foot branches coming out like a little tree. Okay. Two foot one year old branches and grew it more like that. There are some vineyards that don't use posts because some some wine grapes are very stiff and not vigorous. They grow short branches, so they don't even bother to put a support on them. I, I don't recall. Maybe the, the Pinot, some of those grapes, they're real non-vigorous and they can grow them like little trees rather than actually as a vine. So, and I've grown that too. I, I trained some grapes in my backyard as trees to see what they would do. Yeah, they, they didn't act normally. So all we do in this kind of shaping is this convenience to the person pruning and maintaining their vines. And in fact, my first grapevine, I grew it on the ground. I thought it's going to take years for this thing to get big enough to, uh, you know, to put on a support. So I didn't worry about the first year. First year, it grew like 30 feet in all directions. And I had 11 clusters <laughs> growing on the ground the next year. So uh, now when you plant grapes, especially in the ground, um, like in vineyards, they do not fertilize the first year. Grapes are so vigorous uh, in the ground that uh, they they say in vineyards, they often grow seven years, not requiring any fertilizer at all. So you put in the ground, you see how fast they're growing. If they grow 10 feet that year, you don't need to fertilize them. In a pot, we usually do because in potting soil, there's nothing in there unless the potting soil has something in it. But generally, uh, we do fertilize them initially. And in pots, you probably will always have to fertilize because there's not much um, of nature going on in the pot like there is in the ground. How often would you fertilize? A couple times a year? Well, most of my grapes at my house, I I never ever fertilized them because they were close enough to other fruit trees. They just share shared what they were getting, and they would just grow like twenty foot every year. <laughs> it's like 
didn't even think about fertilizing them in the ground. But if they're in a pot, how often do you fertilize? Once a year is plenty. Once I mean, okay. you just watch the growth. If they, if you know, most grapes are so fast. If they make it to about seven, eight foot, don't bother. They don't need much fertilizer mm -hmm. at all. They say all the grapes ever need now and then in the in the, in the vineyards, maybe one shot of nitrogen every seven years. But in, uh, grapes do well for 30 to 40 years and then they get non-productive. I mean, the, the stems on grapes after 10 years, you know, the bottom of the stems are already that thick. So they get pretty woody after a while. Now, uh, we we're reading about what they do in Napa. So in Napa, they're not allowed to grow anything but grapes there, which is stupid, but that's Napa Valley. You know, they're, they want to just grow this vineyards. So when the grapes get too old, and they do get too old after 30, 40 years, they pull them out of the ground. You can't grow a grape for a grape that's just pulled out of the ground. It's, it's a, most of the roots are still in the ground. It's a dead body there. So they have to leave that land fallow for 10 years until the grape roots are gone before they can replant the vineyard. And it's like, that's so silly. They, they could grow apples or something else for the next 10 years, but they're not allowed to as far as what occurred. So they're just stuck with growing weeds for 10 years and then they can put the grapevines back in. You can't fumigate that? Well, you could. You can fumigate it, which would sterilize the soil, but it's really hard to get fumigants nowadays unless you unless the farm is doing it regularly. They can't get a permit to fumigate. There's not a fumigants. You know, fumigants are supposedly uh, bad for the ozone layer. <clears throat> so uh, it's hard to get those now. I mean, they can't do it like when they do strawberries or pepper. Well, even strawberry farmers, they're, they're fewer and fewer fumigants yeah. fume being sold. They had a problem with one of them uh, 20 years ago, or it's more than that, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. A train car from Southern Pacific Railroad filled with, what was it? It was um, a fumigant they were allowing homeowners to use at that time, vape ham. Fell into the Sacramento River, wiped out all the wildlife in that river, just wiped it out. Now, the way you get rid of fumigants when you use it in your yard, so you you get your soil nice and wet, spray the vape ham in there, cover with plastic so it stays wet. As long as it's wet, the vape ham is trapped in the water and it's killing everything in the ground. <clears throat> and then you lift off the plastic, air it out. And then when it's dry, the vape ham evaporates into the air and it's gone. So what they had to do in the Sacramento River was bubble air in there. They get the vape ham out of it. it. Took them months and months to get the vape ham out. And after that, they said, "We're not allowing this to be shipped anymore." So they made that illegal to sell. Uh, so, so anyway, so yeah. So if you remove a grape plant, you can replant right away. You got to switch the soil out if you want to replant right away. At least uh, a couple cubic foot of soil, uh, which will get you at least a 10, 15 foot lawn and vine in that, that amount of virgin soil there. <laughs> so same with any plant. Uh, when you replant, uh, you got to change the dirt out or change the location. So I've grown grapes on. You know, a two foot wide trellis, big enough to hold maybe 20 clusters of grapes. I've grown them on a 70 foot length of, of wrought iron fence. That's fine. I've grown them on a patio roof. And I've actually grown a grape in my apple tree. Just didn't like the apples enough. So I grew the grapes in there and there were grapes hanging next to apples on this tree. So just about anything you want to do. And I've grown them on the ground and grown them shaped like a tree also. So, um, you can fit them almost anywhere, so they don't need cold sun. Um, they're on the north side of my house, south side, west side. So just about any place. They just watch the varieties. Uh, Thompson Seabus and Flame Grape, we do not recommend, nor do we recommend most of the pure European grapes. Uh, names like Perlet, uh, 
Manuka, oh, there's a uh, ruby. There's a lot of seedless table grapes that we don't grow here. I'll mention some of the ones that we do grow that we don't have right now, just so you know. So Sulphur Red has a daughter called Reliance, which is a real good red seedless. Einset, another good red seedless. Uh, Rasmataz, which is a real interesting grape. That's a muscat hybrid. Uh, real tough, real thick skin, but not tough skin. It's almost like the skin is like uh, a raisin skin, which is really interesting. Um, Vanessa. So those are some of the red. And then the black is the uh, Venus, Jupiter, Mars. That's a series that University of Arkansas produced. Uh, we think Jupiter, well, Venus is always considered one of the top tasting grapes, but Jupiter is really good too. We're thinking Jupiter might become our best selling grape. I mean, Suffolk Red, still, most people like red grapes better than purple, than the blue grapes, but Jupiter is awful good. I mean, when we ate that for the first time this year or last year, we ate a few, but this year we had a lot. We really enjoyed it. And the white grapes, there's Neptune, which is another one of the planet series. That's really good. Um, Interlaken, we've sold this for a long time. Um, that one's got a definite Chardonnay flavor to it. Really, really good grape. And Lake Mont. Lake Mont and Interlake, and they are both siblings, are both uh, daughters of Thompson Seedless. And of the two, Lake Mont resembles Thompson Seedless the most. They like Thompson Seedless, they like Lake Mont. But there's also Romaley. which is the media grape we sell. I mean, they're big. They're media like you think Tom Seelis is. A little bit more golden color than Tom Seelis. And we've also liked Spartan. I mean, there's a whole bunch of grapes. Spartan is another good white one. We'll have these for sale uh, later this year. The supple bread we have now, we'll hope to have supple bread later on. We're trying to figure out which one of these two are the better of the two. Uh, our one of our great suppliers says Reliance, daughter of Supple Grid, is better than Supple Grid. We haven't proven that yet. Supple Grid, at least here, may be better than Reliance, but we're, we're checking them out. Now, the black grapes we've never seen, no do on ever. The white grapes uh, will get no do near the coast. We haven't, we haven't seen mildew on any of these here, but when we were in Irvine, we saw mildew on these two, these two white grapes. One year got mildew. Supple bread got mildew one year. That was 2015, a real nasty, boggy year. We didn't see any mildew on, on Einset or, or Vanessa, and nothing on, we never seen any mildew on the black grapes, not on the grapes themselves. Sometimes at the end of the year, you get a little bit on the stems, but nothing to put the grape. Now, most of these grapes crop out in, say, July. Late June, July is the main month for grapes ripening. Um, usually the white grapes ripen before the darker colors, but it's not, not every single one. I think Spartan's kind of late. And, and Neptune was a little bit later too. Again, they'll all hang a long time. Now, a lot of grapes, if you cut them severely right after that first crop, 
so that they want to grow because you cut them back, a lot of times you'll get a second crop. Uh, second crop, not nearly as good as first because it's getting cool as it develops, rather than getting warm as it develops, it's getting cool. So it's not as good, but it's not bad. When we have, I have a cluster of grapes on a table out the door that I should have brought it in that we just discovered on Spartan that was still hanging there here in December. Mm -hmm. Because some cut it back after that first crop and get it out of the way, and it made a few grapes on the second crop. So the wine grapes, the main thing we do is is not save as much branches. So when they're making wine grapes, they don't want to have a whole lot of clusters. They'd rather have fewer clusters. So instead of leaving two or three foot of stem, they only leave two or three nodes, sometimes even one node. So it's shorter piece, one foot, even six inches of growth on that because they want all the energy concentrated into fewer clusters. And they generally don't water as much either because they'd rather have it more concentrated in less water in that group. <clears throat> so vineyards, they do grow them with the water deficit, but don't try it at your house. Uh, they say when they use a the water deficit, it's all computer control. They have to, they have to know by, you know, they don't know by sight. They have to consult the computer. You know, we want to be around, they found out they can grow the wine grapes with half the normal water that they normally would think of on a grapevine, but they have to make sure they don't break a certain point or else they lose their crop. So. It's all done by computers, but they did find out, yeah, the wine grapes, not table grapes, table grapes you want to keep them really moist so you get a bigger grape. But on the wine grapes, uh, they can actually grow that crop with half the normal water for a grape plant. So that's, that's, a, that's probably what saved them during the drought, the dry years we've had, <clears throat> is they can hold back on that water not have to really as much. I mean, it's kind of sad this year, uh, so far, as of uh, the 1st of December, they're allocating the farmers this year 5% of their allocation. Mm -hmm. Okay, nothing. Well, they see the wine yeah, can change better with them with that. Well, I'm sure it's true, yeah, but half the water you get, you get, you get yeah. more concentrated, everything more concentrated. But yeah, it's a little scary when they say, okay, well, last year they were allocated 0% in December. So we'll see how much they get toward the end. And this is the first time in a couple of years that they've allocated anything in December because the snowpack right now is uh, 100 and about 160% of normal and climbing. Okay, questions on grapes. Yeah, so these are ready for the ground. So regular vineyards, they don't even have anything that looks like this. A lot of vineyards, they just order budwood that's one or uh, two or three nodes long. This piece like this, cut it off, stick it in the ground. So that's how we grow grapes. Or that's so you'll see all our other grape plants have been chopped up because we took all this budwood. And made new, or we're making new plants and stick them in a pot like this. Let them stick out about an inch. So most of the stem is in the dirt. Now we use quite, we use clean dirt. So our acid makes potting. So we put it in a pot like this, stick and cutting in six to eight inches long. And about 95% of them grow. So well, I'm going to be putting mine in a pot, so I need to get your soil because my ground's really wonderful, but it's going into a pot. So I'll have to get your soil right. Yeah, our acid makes what we use for grapes, hold okay. a little more water. Okay. Although you can, if you want, just set your big pot in a tray of water. In the it's, ground, is it just like the normal pH around here? Yeah. yeah, they're not real picky about that at all. Um, so the difference again in pots is that during the day, if we have this, this plant's this big, 
the soil in here is going to dry out. So when your when your moisture level goes up and down like that, the grapes stay small, and sometimes they crack. But usually they just stay small. But if you can keep the moisture level high at all times, the grapes get bigger. Like in the ground, they usually get bigger because usually the soil is moisture. Not always. I mean, for ten years I grew my interlaken grape, and they came out like this big. I thought interlaken is a small grape. And then what my neighbor did is he had never planted his backyard. Suddenly, he, behind my wall, he started a garden. I say, well, my interlakens were a lot bigger. I go, oh, I wasn't watering enough. Or his trees were stealing my water because he finally put in a sprinkler system on his side. And suddenly, my grapes are getting bigger. So, uh, so we know that the, the water, you know, ample water plays a key on the size of grapes. So, besides mildew, we don't see much going on with grapes at all. Um, and again, if you get the right grapes, you won't see the mildew either, right? Unless you're right on the coastline. It's at the Orange County Fairgrounds in Costa Mesa. We we planted a lot of grapes there for them. Uh, we gave them and sold them some grapes. We sold the Venus. They wanted a, a, we sold them Einset, the red one, because those two are very mildew resistant. I don't remember if we sold them a white grape or not. <laughs> okay, kiwis. Even though kiwi name came from New Zealand, the, the plant itself is from China. So it's from Eastern China, areas that are not extremely hot not extremely cold the winter so more well they get hot there but it's like the east coast in the united states south carolina north carolina uh so milder winters than say new england or minnesota so kiwis have been unfortunately said to be tropical uh but no they're they need chill they actually need chill now we haven't found a grape yet that doesn't grow here so grapes do not need that winter chill at all. At least the grapes we've grown, we've grown over the years, many, many, many types of grapes, and they all have done fine. But kiwis need chill, just like peaches and plums do. Uh, and because the weather got warmer in the 90s, steadily warmer until 20, let's say we got warmer until about 2018, and then it's cooled off since then uh the kiwi farms that used to be in southern california are now gone because they were getting in they were getting some years but very little crop so they just cut them down so the kiwi farms now are all in the central valley central valley gets at least 800 hours of chill every winter whereas here we get maybe 200 300 hours of chill uh, in the valley down in Sandu County, where we saw them growing them, they're probably getting 300 to 400. They're right at the bottom of a, of a fairly narrow valley. So the kiwis need that chill to do really well. So unless, if you live on a hillside, I wouldn't do it now. One of my relatives up in the canyon here in the Bill Park, they lived at the bottom of the uh, hill. And their kiwi vines actually did okay. We, we visited them in 2008. Yeah, and they were getting crops on their kiwis at that time. Uh, they did tell us, and these are uh, kiwis here, <clears throat> they did tell us that they planted them and after seven years of no fruit, they just gave up waiting, and ignored them, and by the but they said by the ninth year they were fruiting really well. So now they they actually take care of them again. So the the problem with kiwis is that you do have a male and a female, and the male does not fruit. So and the males generally are, you know, when you get get them. 
uh, you might want to either paint them or somehow label them so you know which one is which because a lot of people lose one of their kiwi vines and then they can't figure out which one it is and they don't bloom for three or four years so uh, um, or they may not bloom sometimes you get bloom early you can tell by the flower which is male and which is female because generally if you have a flower and it's a female flower the center stigma is the main thing in the flower it's a male flower that the petals out here the males have those anthers with the pollen on them to go like that with nothing in the middle so female flower male flower female flower flowers often have little remnants of the male parts and the male flower little remnant of the female part but they're not developed so you need a male and a female the problems with the kiwis is that the plants grow incredibly fast. Um, and they get incredibly big and heavy. So they, you know, some of the vineyards tried to switch over to kiwis a long time ago because they were, at that time, they were worth more money. But uh, they couldn't grow them on the same structures. They literally said you needed a four by four posts to support the vine's weight. <clears throat> so it's a very, very heavy vine very quickly. I mean, in a couple of years, the stem's already that thick. And the main problem we have with kiwis is their vigor. It's hard to slow them down. And what they say is the problem with kiwis is that your flowering wood forms off the old parts of the plant. But the new growth keeps covering up. And if you don't uncover the, the old growth, the flower buds can't develop on those short spurs. Thing. So they make short spurs. Like you can see, couple, these are almost like short spurs. They're actually just long things cut off. But they'll often develop little nubs along the older branches that are the spurs for the flower and the fruit form. And you got to keep the leaves that form on those little spurs uncovered. And if that new growth keeps shading them, then you never get through. You got to keep making sure that that new growth doesn't cover the where the spurs are where the fruit's growing. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to keep them cool. Um, so as far as placement goes, I probably wouldn't put this on a pergola or anything high off the ground. Try to keep them close, lower to ground. The air definitely in the wintertime is colder near the ground than it is 10 feet off the ground. So try to keep the beans uh, low down on a fence somewhere. Mm -hmm. Which sun do they want? That I don't know. I would assume all the farms are in full sun. Um, I don't know. I haven't grown kiwis before. That's one thing I have not done. I'm shocked. <laughs> well, we grew the both self fertile kiwis, so they spoke have self fertile kiwis too. But when we grew them, the kiwis are the size of grapes. So like one bite, it's like, okay. And it only made a few and we asked the, the supplier, how do you get these things to make more fruit? You buy a pollinator. Well, this is sulfur. <laughs> and so they're only partially sulfur. So we gave up on that one right away. You know, real small kiwi fruit and hardly any of them on the self fertile plant. And to make them make more fruit, you'd have to buy, get another type of kiwi to pollinate them. So we just gave up on the self fertile kiwis. <clears throat> now these two, uh, Tamuri, when the male is Tamuri, the female is Vincent. <clears throat> Vincent was developed in Orange County, I understand. It's not considered one of the top quality kiwis, but it is a lower chill kiwis. Tamuri is about the lowest chill male, so those are the ones we're stuck with. But if we, you know, I don't, we haven't been told what the chill actually is. So we, so we don't know, uh, let's tell you on that. We think it's probably around 300 hours. People who have developed Orange County kind of might be 300 to 350. There was a Kiwi farmer who lived in Fountain Valley, but in a low spot where he was getting 
quite a bit of chill there. So, and I think he's the one who developed Vincent. I'm not positive that, but. Uh, So Hayward is the one they usually grow commercially, a little better quality, although I haven't tasted the difference. Um, and so far, no one from um, New Zealand has offered us the golden kiwi plants. <laughs> the ones that are in the store, they have a little sweeter taste than the green fleshed ones. But, uh, and people keep asking for the plants and we have not seen that at all in California yet. I don't think they're in California yet. I think they're all being sent from somewhere else. <clears throat> Either that or the one in California is under lock and key. You can't get any plants from it. And the problem with going kiwi from seeds is that you never know what you're going to get if you plant a kiwi seed. So you can try it, uh, but you might get a male plant, you might get a female plant, you know, you just don't know what you're going to hear. That's what makes, you know for years. <laughs> right, and that's what makes breeding kiwis more difficult, in fact, that you have that male and female combo that you can get. Okay, pomegranates. So the center of the pomegranate world is not here. It's actually Turkey. <laughs> and the historians believe that pomegranate originates somewhere between Turkey and China, somewhere in that area there. Some geneticists believe it's actually India. Um, and they evolve because they find tropical pomegranates in southern India and the regular tempered pomegranates in northern India. We grow mostly tempered pomegranates, but we do sell one tropical one too. We'll mention a little later. Now, in the, the U.S., the wonderful pomegranate, the one at the supermarkets, was essentially our only already sold for about 100 years and still at the supermarkets pretty much that's all you'll see is wonderful it was developed in florida in 1910 around 1900 anyway and brought to california does a little better in california does in florida but among the world's palm grants wonderful doesn't rate in the top 10 more like in the top 25 or so so it's big, got hard seeds, it's sweet tarts, still good, but uh, it's not the top rated one. So among the taste test winners, the top rated one is Park Bianca. Now note that taste tests are tend to favor bland fruits. So to us, to my daughter and myself, we don't rate Parfiant in the highest. We like Ariana better. And it's got just a little bit more bite to it. The description in our catalog is very fruit punchy. So a little more bite than something, you know, it's got a little bite in it. Parfiant is very mild. <clears throat> they describe it as fine red wine. But, um, so it's like on apples, Fuji rates number one. Well, I'm not, I think Fuji's kind of bland. I'd rather eat Sundown or Honeycrisp or Pink Lady, something with more bite to it. So it just depends on your taste. But so Parfum is number one rated. Ariana is generally number two rated. And sometimes in California, Ariana wins the taste test over Parfum. Uh, Massage Sweet CI, which I don't have right now, is rated number three. So I would say one, two, three would be my ratings. <clears throat> when the when these appeared in the U.S., what happened was when the Soviet Union was dissolving in the 1980s, um, a professor in Turkmenstein, the lower area of the Soviet Union, had a collection, Dr. 
Gregory Levine had a collection of pomegranates he had collected from all over that region uh, and and had them on a, at the university steel station in Turkmenstein and they were closing down. I mean, they weren't getting, they no longer were getting any funding. He was carrying bucks to water up the hillside to water his orchard. He contacted all the universities around the world said, I'm sending you Budwood. In other words, we want to save this collection, but I can't save it here. <clears throat> So University of California Davis got the budwood planted, uh, you know, 20 or 30, I think the collection might have been even 80 or so pomegranate trees. So they had their first taste off with the Russian ones and the ones that were the top ones in the, in the United States at the time, and Russia took the top seven spots. So the Gregory Levine collection, which is not from all from Russia, he had collected from all over that area. It gave Russian names, though. <clears throat> and uh, they were top rated for two reasons. They had the best balance of, of, of sweetness and acidity. And the seeds were soft, not hard, and they were also small. So small, soft seeds. So the seeds are edible. You hardly even notice that you're eating seeds. And then they have that nice flavor balance. So that's what makes them the best rated. In California, they had wonderful for a long time and people were already developing new varieties. And the top rated one back in the 80s was one called Eversweet. <laughs> which was one of the first soft seeded ones but the seeds were still big and and the flesh was white and brown. So that was our top rated one there. And the Russian ones had small soft seeds, not bland flesh. They were they were good flavored flesh. So ever sweet got knocked down below 10 when these came in. So these are your your better tasting pomegranates. Now they don't juice well. If you want to juice, you go with wonderful. Because you know, soft seeds they just get swishy and they get messed up and get into the into the juice itself. So these aren't the best juicing ones. Uh, I suppose the best juicing one is one called Austin, which is from Syria. Uh, Syria, someone from Syria brought this tree to the city of Austin, Texas. And they started growing it there. And they said, well, this is a wonderful pomegranate for us. Now, what's interesting is that the soft seeded pomegranates will not take cold. We don't get cold here. Turkmenstein apparently didn't get cold either. Texas gets cold. I mean, Texas, which is south of California, <clears throat> that inland climate in inland North America. Texas, they get down into unless you're in, you know down in Houston, they get down to ten degrees. Well, we were having a blizzard when Texas went to Mexico, yeah. right? I mean, they get cold in Texas. They said it's too cold there where they're growing pomegranates to grow these pomegranates with the soft seeds. They they just freeze. So they they can only grow the hard seed one, and Austin is hard seed, and it was working throughout Texas. So they said this is the best pomegranate they've ever seen. Um, it's got seeds that are somewhat smaller than wonderful, but they're still hard. So they, well, I've eaten this. The seeds are crunchy, but they're not hard as wonderful. So they're crunchy. So they still juice well. <clears throat> you can eat the seeds better on this one than you could on wonderful. It's sweeter than wonderful, but not as sweet as these, but it's still really, really good. So uh, we won't have these till later in the year. We have to grow them now. The company that was selling Austin went out of business. <clears throat> At least in California, they went out of business. Fortunately, they're easier, easy to make. Um, they just take a piece of stem that's about nine inches to a foot long. That's about pencil thick. That's one year old and stick in the pot. This, it's almost as easy as grapes here. We get about 80% take on, on the cuttings on pomegranates. So we'll grow those, continue to grow Austin at least. 
Yeah. Yeah, so they don't need any chill. So pomegranates don't need any, any chill at all. The hotter it is in the summer, the happier they seem to be. Um, the warmer it is in the spring, the earlier they wake up. So like this year, we had the 80 degrees in, in February. They were all up in February. They were going and blooming in February. But they respond to the temperature. So if we don't get warm until April, they don't wake up until April. They just wake up when it gets warm. They don't they don't respond to cold. And that may be why the Russian ones don't do well here. Maybe they wake up too early in a in a warm spell on Texas and freeze real bad or something. I don't know. <clears throat> but um Austin did well for them in Texas. So they don't need any chill. You can grow any of them here. Um, wonderful is better inland because it's so tart. You need to get that sugar content high enough to overcome it. The wonderful is best away from the coast, but most of these, no problem. They're there. They don't really have that much acidity in them. So we have this one. This one. We also have the zirconia. <clears throat> which uh, does mean dessert. That was rated number five in the ratings. Um, it's got a, they say citrus overtones, um, orange juice flavor. I don't know, I've eaten, I wouldn't say orange juice, but maybe if you're used to eating pomegranate, say, oh, it's a little orangey tasting. Then we have one called um, pink satin. which they talk about fruit punch flavor. Um, I think this is rated number nine or 10 around the world. It's all, got another name that's uh, actually more famous, uh, Seen Pepe, which means no seeds, or yeah, it's, all, it's a small seeded, soft seeded one. So all these are soft seeded ones. Um, and they all have, again, small soft seeds, but those are highly rated, so that's in stock too. <clears throat> so, Misarski and Austin will have later, and then one called Siren Evian, which is um, said to be somewhat watermelon flavored, maybe a little bit even more mild. <laughs> Dave Wilson stopped growing Misarski and Siren Evian. I said, we have too many pomegranates. You know, they sell like 20 varieties, said there's not enough difference. But I like Jasarski, which the full name is Jasarski Razovi. Um, the book said it tastes like the best lemonades. And before we ever ate it, customer asked me, well, what does that mean? <clears throat> so we had a couple fruit hang on a 15 gallon tree. We go, okay, let's try this one. So when you bite into it, it's sweet. It's just sweet. Well, when you swallow the juice, you get that finishing astringency that lemonade has when you're swallowing it. It gets you right in the throat. You go, oh, this is... <laughs> Both he and I thought, boy, this is a really good pomegranate. <laughs> Got that finishing astringency like uh, some of the wines do. They have that finishing astringency. Makes it real interesting. Um, we thought that's a good one. It's worth worth growing that. Serenavia, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep growing that or not. We'll see. But the Jasarski I thought was worth it. So, uh, are you growing Jasarski? Yeah, so we've got cuttings. Uh, well, we'll be taking cuttings this winter. My my plants that we saved. So last year I had a plant that was ten foot tall. The cuttings off that sold it. Took some of those baby cuttings, and now they're about this big. We'll see if we can make cut a few cuttings for this coming year. Okay. Because they're only about the size of this plant. So with a plant this size, you can make two, three, maybe four cuttings on that. This is a dessert here. Yeah. So this is a year older than these. That's about how big they get in one year. So time to production. Um, it's interesting. All these plants this big can fruit this next year if spring is hot. Like this last year, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't hot all the way through. Like 2014, remember that when first year we were here, 
It was 90 degrees all spring. All these plants were making fruit one foot tall. We're just amazed. I mean, very few plants did not have fruit on them. So the heat really made them fruit when they were young. The next year, 2015, the cloudiest spring we've had since we've been here. Only two plants had fruit. Of, you know, like 100 palm, palm rats. Only two plants made fruit that year. It was the worst year. So they... When they're young, at least, they need that heat in the spring to get some energy going. Once they are about five years old, they'll fruit, no matter what the weather is. They just fruit because they've got so much energy stored up in the wood. But when they're young, they're highly dependent on that, that heat that spring to make that crop. So if you're in Riverside, you'll get fruit the first year on something this big near the coast. Depends on the heat. Don't know. Uh, probably around May or June. Check on me. You can email me and and uh, I'll figure out how many, find out how many I'm growing and and save some. Say. <clears throat> now the one that everyone wants us to find is one called Ink. They said the fruit is so dark, it's just about black. I haven't found that yet. Uh, I think one of our customers says he's got it, and hopefully we'll get some bud with this winter. Uh, or some, you know, just some sticks this winter and, and see if we can grow them. The most important thing on pomegranate, and it's not, you know, nothing's that important on pomegranates because you see a lot of, of uh, I've seen pomegranates growing by the side of the road, not in anyone's yard. They're making fruit. But the main thing, they said, don't, not too many trunks. So a lot of orchards only work with one stem. Hmm. But mm -hmm. on these young pomegranate trees, the mm -hmm. first thing they'll do is they'll start making so many branches from the ground. You let them do that. Let them fruit. Let them have enough strength to do it. So you have to limit it. I would say three main trunks. Some farms say they use up to eight. But a lot of farms say they only want one main stem. They want all the energy uh, concentrated. You'll get better production with fewer trunks. So... They just cut right, so they'll make dirt stems out of the dirt for about ten years. You get lots of stems coming out of the dirt every year. You don't want too many of those, if any. You, you might keep a few the first year because sometimes something comes out of the dirt and it's just a monster. Just take it off and say, "Okay, that's my main trunk." Sometimes these small branches here never do anything, and they'll put out a whole new one that just takes off and goes and goes. That's the one I can see on this plant here. Well, a lot of our plants, you know, we, we, well, they'll make a new one that we then say, we then choose that we weren't expecting it to be that big. And then we'll just choose that one. So, but yeah, not too many stems on a pomegranate. And then in the winter, um, you know, they have so many branches. As long as you leave a little bit of, Last year's growth, you'll get flowers and fruit if the weather's warm. But the main thing they do <clears throat> is not let it get too big. So if you keep a tree, <clears throat> we talked about this previous weeks, only five foot wide, that whole tree can be productive because the sunlight can make it all the way through. If you let it get much bigger than that, what we do notice in the, in the orchards is that instead of letting the tree grow big and round, Looking from the top, they will load the tree so that none of these are wider than five feet so the sun can get in there and get more energy into the interior of the tree rather than having just a one circle where there's less surface area on that circle than there is on this. So uh, we see in a lot of orchards too, uh, orange orchard I'm at, they're lobing the tree just the same way. These old trees that they're not keeping small, they're just lobing them so the sunlight can still get inside there, <clears throat> make more fruit. 
tell us about the errand? Okay, so we do grow. <laughs> We're sold out right now. I have to make sure I never sell it completely because no one grows there. So Aaron um, is a tropical pomegranate. One of my neighbors was eating a pomegranate in Singapore. He was in, I think he's an importer, but eating a pomegranate in Singapore liked the pomegranates. So he brought the seeds back, soft seeds, brought some back, planted his backyard in Mission Viejo. And up through this tree, eight foot by eight foot, well, they keep it eight foot by eight foot, so it's a, a lollipop tree, eight foot canopy on it. Flowers year round, fruits year round, full size fruit. Uh, skin on it's lighter in color, either between uh, a manila color and a dark salmon, sometimes light red. The flesh of the of the arrows or the seeds is light red, sweet. Soft seeded. I wouldn't say they're small seeded, so I wouldn't rate it as high as an aria or parfion or Jasarski, but still sweet, soft seeds, flowers year round, fruits. You know, every day you go there, you see flowers on it, see ripe fruit, fruit in between. <clears throat> so it's there is a tropical pomegranate we've always sold, but it's the dwarf pomegranate. So there is a dwarf pomegranate that only grows this big that makes fruit about that big, which are edible. Not great fruit, um, but it blooms year round and fruits year round. Aaron's this regular full size tropical pomegranate, uh, apparently evolved in the southern half of India. Um, it will go to sleep if there's a frost. We've never seen it go to sleep, but we've been told by Dave Bosnia they they worked with some of the tropical pomegranates. And if it is cold up there, then they just go to sleep. They lose their leaves and they wake up real early. And around here, this thing never has gone to sleep for us yet. Any day you look at a mature tree, you'll see flowers. So this keeps going. I have a question, and kind of maybe you've already touched on it in the past, but I'm really curious. When I was a kid, I think my dad planted Eversweets. He was back in the 70s, and he planted like 10 of them. So we go to eat them, and this is maybe help me here. We're like, I might be an idiot here, but we'd cut them open and we'd go pull the pomegranates out. And you're eating them, and you get that I don't know if you call that the seed, that white piece that's at the bottom. Is that what you consider the mm -hmm. seed? Okay, because in those ever sweet, they had a lot of seed, it seemed like, and it was always spitting that part out. So here's my question. There's a grower over there that sells at the orange uh, farmer's market mm -hmm. and he sells the pomegranate juice and his pomegranate juice is the best I've ever had. And, but it's not like palm, like that, that palm pomegranate juice is really thick and dark and doesn't have a lot of flavor in my opinion. His pomegranate juice over there is much lighter. Okay, so here's my question. How in the world, what kind of machine separates those seeds from that juice is there a machine that does that how is that done do you know i don't know oh do you do it see okay so do you get a lot of the seeds are they pretty thick yeah i do after you filter it. Uh, yeah, right. So does it really, like, when you're blending it all up, I mean, does it make it really thick, the process, like, when you it blend depends. it? Blend it just a little bit. See, it's still whole. And they won't want it to be good. Okay, so that's, so you're not, like, fully, okay, I see what you're saying. So let me ask you something. How long does it take you to separate those seeds from that skin? Well, um, take me one hour to six So it's a long time. Do you stick them in water? Like, I'll say stick them in water and they kind of lose. You just pop them out, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's as a kid, we would just put them backwards and pop them. They, they don't peel, they don't separate. Right. They just, it's the press. Yeah. The press. 
Right. Well, I am so curious how this guy over at Orange does his stuff. I because if you ever go over to Orange Market, he sells this beautiful pomegranate juice, and it's he sells big jugs and small jugs, and he sells out. Like it's really good. If you ever go to the Orange Circle ask Farmers Market, using, so ask him if he's using Angel Sweet. Angel Sweet came out in the eighties, and it was touted as being juicier than wonderful. And they said even the membranes between the arrows were sweet too. Okay. So it, it might be that, then you don't have to separate the membrane out. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was called Angel Red. The Angel Red that came out. No, the grower we used lost the the rights to sell that one, but, and then he went out of business anyway. We used to. Uh, I never did eat the fruit though. We sold out every year, uh, but someone gave us, I think I've got a plant growing. Someone gave us some cuttings of it last year. So I've got some plants growing. So hopefully I might be able to make cuttings in this coming year, but uh, uh, the seeds weren't as soft or as small as these, but they were softer than wonderful. But I, again, I never ate one, so I don't know. So we'll, I'll see it in my collection I, at, at a growing ground if we still have one. And I'll save that one and get fruit first. But they grew that at the Great Park in, in Irvine. They had an orchard of that for a while there of the uh, angel reds. Yeah. There was another one called Sweet, which was pink flesh and soft seeded also. But uh, Eversley was top rated for a while, but now, nowadays these are much better. Um, pomegranates, not picky about soil quality at all. Um, they like it on the wet side if you want better flesh. Commercially, they've always warned the farmers that after they're ripe, back off from the water, or else just put your fruit open. Now, the Fruit does split open naturally when it's real old. Um, but if you back off in the water, you're more likely to split when it rains. So, <clears throat> you know, when when fruits when a fruit tree is dry, it takes water out of the fruit. So the fruit will shrink, and then when it rains, it just blows open. So be careful. It's better to keep them on the wet side, never let them dry out so they don't shrink in the first place, so they don't split in response to rain. Now, some books have said that pomegranates are drought resistant. So back in 1998, part of my yard where I had my pomegranates was underwater because of the El Nino that year, or the rains that year. I don't think it was an El Nino year. It was this real wet year. And it was underwater for three months. I thought, my pomegranates are going to die. They did really well that year. They were underwater for three months. You know, not that real deep, this much water around the base of the trees because there's a little spot of my yard. And I was surprised. They they just did fine with that water. So they're not burst to water at all. Uh, but they can handle drought fairly well among fruit trees too. Uh fertilizer wise, never anything special with them. This this is kind of a ordinary fertilizer. Now they do seem to be able to get What's new on pomegranates lately in the last five years? We've seen a lot of warping of the leaves in the summertime. Uh, Dave Wilson Nursery hasn't, no, well, no one's done any research. Dave Wilson Nursery, their, their thoughts and my thoughts too is that it's some kind of thrips, bug call thrips that attacks new growth of plants and makes it warp because they've attacked when it was young. Um, it's just aesthetic. You can control it with the product that has spinosad in it. If you want, like at the nursery, we spray them. When we're spraying spinosad, we'll just spray the, uh, um, uh, pomegranates so they don't get that warp leaf at the end of the year. Um, it's a little bug. It's a real tiny bug that flies around, lays eggs, the lay, the babies hatch out. They suck on the new leaves. It's hard to spot them, and when, by the time you see the damage, they're gone. They they only attack leaves when the leaves are real tiny and first forming. So we assume it strips. When we spray with spinosad, it seems to lessen the problem a bit. 
but uh, no one's done any research on it because it's not economically important. It's not affecting the crop at all because it comes in late term here. Any other questions? That's a um, pomegranate. That's the Zuni pomegranate, right? So, this is more than one stem. Right, that's got it. Yeah. Okay, right now it's got three fronts mm -hmm. developing. So, should I just cut the other two and leave one? You can, that makes it simpler. It's because, because this one does have crossing branches on top of it, which is not good structure for any plants. Although you can you can do this and separate them so that they don't develop close together mm -hmm. and have a bigger tree to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it's better to go cut off the other one and here you just go like this. Oh no, you generally don't prune them much. You just make sure that they have you know they have access to sun. Now if you want to keep it small, you know, say you want to keep it five foot high and eight foot tall. Then yeah, you've got to cut it back every year. But as long as you don't cut off all of these, is this for your flowers and new growth and flowers and fruit will come off of? As long as you don't cut it down to real thick wood every winter and and not leave some of this, then you're still going to get fruit. So there's some you know generally you don't have to worry about it as much because there's so much branching on pomegranates. You can cut them severely, still have a lot of this year old growth on it, where you will get flowers and fruit. So. Mm -hmm. How long does it take for the plant to have fruit? I know you said a year. It kind of depends on the heat, right? Like I haven't grown enough year. pomegranate to tell you. I would say the first time I grew pomegranates, we had cooler springs. Uh, this was in the early 90s and mid 90s. I didn't get any fruit on any of my trees till the fifth year. So don't give up. Right. So I thought five years was normal until we moved. Until we started getting those hotter springs, it's only, oh, we're getting fruit this year. <laughs> you know? So, you know, the heat and the age will depend, will determine how much fruit is that here. Oh, there is a little bit better production when you have two different kinds of pomegranates. So they're self fertile, quite self fertile, but not totally self fertile. So, most orchards will have at least two different kinds of pomegranates in the orchard. Um, but, you know, one, I would say one will probably make about 80, 85% of its crop by itself. But if you want that last bit of crop forming, it's almost the same with the apples. The apples, pretty much self-fertile, 85% self-fertile, maybe 15% extra if you get another variety in there. So, there's something else I'm going to mention is too. Oh, when you have one other variety, just... Just because we have it here, we'll mention it. Um, most people won't like that one. It's a very tart, white fleshed, white fruit, white flowers. So it's mainly ornamental, but my daughter likes the fruit. She likes tart things. So you've got a big one in the ground back here that's making flowers and fruit. So anything about it's white, it is tart. Some people will like it, most people will not. Is it properly in containers forever? Just like any other plant in container, you'll get 10 years out of a container plant before it really starts taking a nosedive. Um, and they're a little bit light fruiting. I mean, Aaron in a pot we love because this thing flowers year round, so we know you're always going to have fruit on that. It's like a 15 gallon pot will almost have like four or five ripe fruit on it at all times. Whereas the rare pomegranate, because they only bloom once a year, uh, you're not going to have as much fruit on on that as you would in Aaron. Aaron, uh, it's interesting; it never stops. So that's our best fruiting pomegranate, and certainly. The first one of any pomegranate, Aaron's, I've got an Aaron at a grow ground this tall that already made a fruit. <laughs> yeah. Less than a foot tall and it made a fruit, full size fruit. I, I couldn't believe it. The thing wouldn't grow because it was making fruit, but I wanted to see if it can do it at that age. And 
yeah, a very fast fruit. Uh, usually, you know, if you plant an error and within six months, you've got fruit. No matter what size it is, you've got fruit that's formed within that six month period. Whereas all these, you know, once a year bloom, spring bloom. So if you miss it, that's it. I mean, most pomegranates bloom in the summer, but the summer flowers rarely make a fruit. Rarely they make a fruit. It's usually just spring bloom. The first flowers that make the best fruit. Uh, very few diseases are passed on pomegranates. Uh, again, the thrips, sometimes we get scale, ants and scale, and that's about it. So nice that they're pretty release for Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.